Hello, and thank you for joining us for this special edition of Addiction Talk. As you may be aware, today is International Overdose Awareness Day. We are losing so many people to this addiction overdose crisis that we've brought a panel in tonight to discuss what can we do, what are the answers, and what can we learn from their stories. Our panel has a powerful, powerful story to share, insights that you may not have heard before. And what we really hope that happens here tonight is that you walk away with the tools to not only know how to save someone's life, but to intervene if you suspect that someone is struggling, one of your loved ones with, with addiction. Because we know that many people are struggling, many people are dying, and we must do something to act now. Addiction Talk starts now. Well, warning tonight after a spike in overdose deaths in Will County. Then all of a sudden we got fed and have a lot of very high risk potential for overdose. Reporting this week on America's worsening fentanyl crisis, and today the CDC shared a truly staggering statistic on drug overdoses. You know, COVID-19 has made this situation a lot worse. We can't lose sight of these other epidemics of loss of overdose crises. We need to meet this crisis with urgent action. And, you know, when you just see that and even you hear the president saying, you know, we need to meet this with urgent action. It's just a reminder of what we need to be doing in this moment, that we have to be talking about this on International Overdose Awareness Day. And who better to talk about this than Cami Wolf Rice? Um, she is an author. She's an advocate. She's a mother. And her story that you're going to hear in just a few minutes is is very powerful because it's a reminder of, you know, the faces behind this tragedy, the faces behind the overdose epidemic, the faces, the loss. And so, you know, we're here to share her story. So I'm going to bring her on now um, to talk more about her experience and and why she's such an advocate for this. So thank you, Cami, first of all, for being willing on International Overdose Awareness Day to to share your story and to help other families out there who maybe in the same boat as you tonight. Thank you, Joy, for having me. This is such an important show. I appreciate the opportunity. Well, first, Cami, I wanted to start with your, you know, many people think about addiction just affecting the individual, but often addiction affects families. And I know this was something that your son struggled with. Take me through what you guys dealt with as a family and your experience. Well, my son, this actually happened over 20 years ago. My son had a surgery, a surgery, a major surgery, and we went home with 90 Oxycontins right at the exact time that Purdue Pharma released the wonder drug Oxycontin. And we were not warned. We were not told that the Oxycontin was addictive. And I was told to give them to him every four hours, which I did. And I, I think that people don't realize you can become addicted with one prescription. And so this started over 20 years ago. It started something you think harmless. He goes in, he's having pain, a pain medication. What ended up happening over the course of years? How did this lead him to struggling? Well, we had 90 Oxycontins followed by 90 more. Uh, we didn't realize that he had a problem. We didn't even know to look for anything. And actually he came to me and said, mama, I need help. And we had multiple rehab treatment centers, Joy. We did everything to fight it. And he fought it for over half of his life. And honestly, just he lost his, he lost his will and he overdosed. And it took me two years to even say the word overdose because of the stigma that our society brings to people that have kids suffering with addiction. Did you feel during that time, Cammie, and even when he was struggling, like you said, you guys did everything you could. Did you feel like you had to hide this? Did you feel like there was, it was hard to, to even share this with close family and friends? Absolutely. 
Absolutely. And had I you know, now know what I know now, uh, you need a tribe, you need a village around you, you need family and friends to support and connect and love and accept the individual. It's a disease just like cancer and we need to treat it as such. And, you know, I just didn't know and I, and I didn't want people to disrespect him. And I wanted him, and as sick as this sounds, Joy, I wanted my son to have a respectable death. This is a child that wanted to be a Navy SEAL. He was an AP student, you know, and when people say addict, you have this immediate image that comes into your mind. And um, so this is my baby here. And mm. Yes, um, I really want to break the stigma because you have to talk about it to get the help that you need. And Cammie, how old was he when he had the overdose? Um, yes, he passed away February 26th, 2016. And Joy, since his passing, there's been over 300,000 deaths. Hmm. And he was very young at that time. And, and so when you think about what you hope people will hear or learn from your story. What is the message that you feel like we have to continue to get out? Because you said, since then, think about how many more people we have lost. These are sons, these are daughters, these are loved ones, these are our family members. What do you feel like is the message that we need to be sending? How do we begin to, to cope with this or even to, to raise arms about this? I know your organization is called Crusade. You know, So what do we need to do? Absolutely. I, you know, I, I think people need to realize this is the largest epidemic our country we will ever see in our lifetime, ever, any of us. And I don't think there's enough conversation, enough warning. And that's why every time I can get on a microphone or have an opportunity like this, Joy, to speak out, to understand that you can, first of all, there's two different areas with this, right? There's fentanyl and there's street drugs, and then there's prescription writing. And you have to understand if you go even to the dentist, do you, when you're getting your wisdom teeth pulled or you're getting uh, a root canal, do you need 30 Percocet? Absolutely not. You need Motrin and ice. And I think we as a society are afraid to ask doctors questions, ask dentists questions. Is there a non-narcotic solution for the pain? And we have to stop it before it starts. And that's why I really the swim lane at Christopher Wolf Crusade is prevention. Hmm. So you really think when we're talking about this tonight, you talked about the three areas, you know, we have the fentanyl, which is one of the main culprits right now. But then you also have people who started on pres prescription pain medications, developed an addiction and then found themselves either using heroin or other things. You know, then also, you know, there's just other stuff that's out there. Um, that people are overdosing on, unfortunately. And so if there was a warning, what would you have said? If, if you could look back, I know you talk about talking to the doctors, being willing to have those tough conversations, you know, about pain medications or what's going on, but what warning would you give to a mother or another family about, you know, who, who is concerned about this tonight? You really do have to be your own health advocate and especially for your children. And you need to understand that prescription does not equal safe. Mm -hmm. And we can't look for the answers in pills. I think that, you know, when we think we're in pain, we immediately think taking a pill and it needs to be non-narcotic. There's ice, there's all kinds of holistic things that you can do for pain, as opposed to self-medicating through alcohol or through opioids. If you do have to be on an opioid because of a car accident or a sporting accident, then you need to understand how fast you need to taper off that medication because you be can become addicted. Mm -hmm. So I would say that. And then in regards to fentanyl, um, our country is under a chemical warfare attack. It's that simple. I went to a meeting in Washington DC with the DEA and that specifically was said to all of us Man. parents that have lost our children. We're under a chemical warfare attack. There are, drugs have been around forever, Joy, and people mm -hmm. experiment in college and so forth and try things. You can't do that in today's world because it could be poisoned and it shouldn't really even be called overdose. It's mm. murder. This is premeditated murder. There's poison in one pill. You're not overdosing. 
you're being poisoned. And so honestly, I believe it. I know we're going to talk about this later. Everyone should own Narcan. Everyone should have Narcan to save a Yes, life. absolutely. And you know, when you think about that, because a lot of people are like, do I need to carry it? But you never know because these are, you know, like we said, so many people are dealing with this and then unsuspecting, you know, or overdosing and don't even have any clue of what's in what they're taking. They have no clue sometimes, especially if they're getting it off the street. They don't have any clue. So when you think about sharing your story, I know you have a book coming out that you're going to be um, talking about this. What do you hope people take away from the book um, and then just from your foundation and what you're trying to do? I know you said prevention is big, but what's the, the takeaway? Yes. Well, honestly, I picked one of the hardest things in the world to do, and that's create a new position in healthcare. It's a care coach. You think about in our society, we have coaches for everything. We have a birthing coach, an executive coach, a dietitian coach, a workout coach, right? And when we're in a health crisis, there's no coach to help you through recovery. And so I've had a clinical trial going on here in Atlanta for two years because you have to have the data. And my goal is to have care coaches in hospitals across the United States. And their mm -hmm. job is to give you non-pharmaceutical solutions to pain. We have techniques to help because mental illness is such a piece to this of anxiety, depression, PTSD. And you have all of that when you're in the hospital. So having a coach to get you through that and to educate you that you are taking an opioid and how fast you need to take it off, take off, taper off. Um, that's what needs to be in our healthcare uh, system. It's missing from the healthcare team, in my opinion. So we're creating a new position in healthcare. I wrote the book to cast a wider net. I have QR codes in the back of my book with resources that can constantly be updated so that the information will never be stagnant. And while I share my opioid journey, it really helps the reader to reflect on their own journey because mm -hmm. I had to, because the pain is so severe, unfortunately, being on your panel tonight, I'm the one that lost a child. I wish I was one of the other panelists that my son survived the overdose. Mm -hmm. But we, I had to go outside of my of a normal experience to write this book. And I use the plane as a metaphor, as our journey. And we think that people are going to be on that flight with you forever, as I thought mm. Christopher would be with me. And we land at different places in our life, at joy and sorrow and happiness and grief. But you have to keep going. You have to keep moving on your journey. And the okay. sixth stage of grief is finding purpose. And that's what's helped me. I think I moved straight to the stage six of finding mm -hmm. purpose to save other mothers, other fathers, other families from losing their loved ones because it's a tragedy and I miss him every second of every day. There's mm -hmm. nothing worse. I can only imagine experiencing that as a mother, but I can only imagine how proud he must be of you to, to see how you're saving other families and saving other children, you know? So I can only imagine, you know, being on a panel like tonight, does it give you hope at least to know that you are making a difference? Absolutely. I get signs from him every single day and he has helped me so much with taking the pen to paper to the purpose. It's all been driven by my son, to be honest. Wow. Well, we're going to hear more from you, Cami. But first, we want to go into another video. Thank you for sharing your story there. Um, and but we want to go into another video about understanding, you know, overdose. Many people don't know what's happening. What is the risk out there? So take a look at this video. An overdose can result from our body's systems being overwhelmed with the toxic effects of a drug. Depending on what substance a person has taken, symptoms of an overdose vary. People may not realize they are experiencing an overdose, especially if they are heavily under the influence of that drug. Some general symptoms associated with overdose from various substances include severe chest pain, seizures, severe headaches, difficulty breathing, delirium, extreme agitation or anxiety. Overdose might happen accidentally for a variety of reasons. Some people do overdose intentionally. However, most overdoses are unintentional. Well, as we heard there, most overdoses are unintentional and we're joined by a panel. I'm going to bring each of them up. First, we have Jake Arthur. He's an overdose survivor. We have Carla. She is an overdose survivor. We have Philip, who actually helped to revive his own son 
um, from an overdose. And I'm actually going to bring Cami back up too. Um, so five people before we get to our expert tonight who have dealt with this in some extent. So I want to start with you, Carla. Um, as someone who survived an overdose, take me back to your experience because um, we see so many people are experiencing this right now. In 2005, my uh, my father passed away very suddenly and I, I was not prepared for, I mean, no one's prepared for it, but I truly wasn't prepared for this. Um, my mother also too, she was in the hospital at the time on life support. Mm -hmm. And uh, this happened in tandem, this happened within a week of, of one another. And I was already on, I was already taking uh, benzodiazepines for anxiety, for depression. I, at this point, uh, I was already abusing them. I mean, I had already been abusing them for at least two years at that point. But um, after he passed away, I, I was treated for a complicated grief disorder. I could not accept, I, I could not accept that he was gone in any capacity. And each day, each day, I would take a little bit more, would take a little bit more because something about addicts, we can't handle pain. We, we, we can't handle it. And we have, you'll hear addicts refer to that we have this hole inside that we're always trying to close up and that we're always, we're always looking for anything to make that pain go away. And uh, I just, I could not, I couldn't do it. And all I wanted to do was sleep. So my overdose, as mentioned, was not intentional, but um, I had also been in a car accident and I was also taking some other drugs as well um, for back pain. It was not any, it was not opioids. I am, um, I believe that the reason I'm actually still alive today is because I'm actually allergic to codeine. So I can't take anything in, in that class. And uh, I was take, but you know, I, I just wanted the pain stuff. So I was just mixing them sleep. I'd wake up. I was also out on leave during this time from my job. So I was completely unsupervised and I was alone. So um, fast forward to 2016, this has been going on for months. And uh, I woke up one day completely disoriented, not, I, I had no clue what was going on around me. And I started looking around, woke up and my, uh, my little dog was lying across me and I looked down and I noticed that I, I had vomit on me. And uh, I looked at the calendar and three days had passed since my last memory. And uh, again, when you're in the throes of addiction, all you think about is that drug and that fix. The f immediately after I, I wasn't even cognizant, not really, I had to reach for another pill. So um, that is a, uh, three days, three days. Wow. So I know just, you know, thinking about everything that's happening and this is International Overdose Awareness Day. Why is it important, Carla, for you to share your story? I think it's critical because I look back in, in a rational state of mind and I look back on this and I don't it is amazing to me that I'm here to tell this tale today. And it started, it started my own journey of, I, I became very spiritual and, and really started looking at things completely differently. And I believe that we all have a purpose. And I believe that me being able to share my story, uh, that is my purpose. I feel like that sharing my story, I will be able to help someone else. And, you know, this, as Cammie had mentioned, this is, this is all very painful to discuss and to talk about. And, and she also paraphrased what I'm getting ready to say. Um, even though it's painful and even though, you know, we are the ones that, you know, survived the overdose or we're the ones still here. We've lost a loved one. Um, I made the decision to do this today, even though it's extremely painful someone else is in more pain than I am right now. So I think that that's very important to be able to take my pain and find a silver lining and be able to help someone else. No, I think that's so important, you know, being able to, for somebody to hear this and maybe it resonates with them or another family member. Jake, can you relate to a lot of what Carla said when you think about your own story or experience? Absolutely. Um, you know, there's definitely the inherent nature um, to the disease of addiction. And, um, you know, my overdose, uh, you know, 
really rings true with with you know Cammy's story about Christopher and um, you know mine started uh, by prescriptions from a doctor. Um, you know I was in a motor vehicle accident and um, was given prescriptions for you know a good period of time and this was you know well over a decade ago so it was much easier to you know get opioid prescriptions um, in that time frame so um, you know it, it just I became chemically dependent I certainly you know had an addictive personality and came from um, you know a home of addicts and alcoholics as well so it just never registered for me but the problem for me was when I no longer had access to um, those medications that the doctor was prescribing and when they say okay you know you're good you've had enough and it'll no longer prescribe this to you um, then you go seek it out on the street because at that point I, you know the beast is awakened if you will and you know so then I'm putting myself in that situation as far as finding things on the street and um, uh, my major overdose was from some counterfeit pills that I had gotten off the street um, and, you know, just try to take the normal amount that I that I had been taking, um, which was definitely more than, you know, the uh, the label recommended. I can tell you that for sure. But, um, you know, I, I overdosed and, um, you know, went in convulsions and, um, you know, was poisoned, like Cammy mentioned, basically. And fortunately, I had a friend there and um, was able to uh, get to the hospital and and, um, you know, they were able to you know, save me in time. And, um, you know, and definitely just like Carla said, I mean, that's, it, it's my responsibility, um, as a person that has survived because, um, you know, as a person in recovery, um, I've lost so many people with overdoses that, you know, were, you know, you know, friends and, and, or just acquaintances and meeting halls, things like that. Um, there are just so many that, that pass away, um, from overdoses and, um, you know, I think it's a responsibility of a survivor to uh, anytime I'm asked to share that to, uh, you know, to share that with the world, because um, education is important. I think that's just something that um, is one of the biggest factors in, um, you know, preventing overdoses is recovery awareness um, and just teaching people um, just the general society as well. I think people need a better understanding of it, even if you aren't directly an addict yourself. So. Mm -hmm. No, I think that's huge. And so, Philip, I'm going to bring you in, then I'll throw out a couple of questions to the panel. So, Philip, you know, I think your story is unique here in that you are in recovery yourself, but, you know, never imagined that this would happen to your child. Um, came home one day, your child and his friends are upstairs and you get the yell that something's going on. Take me through, you know, briefly what you experienced as a parent having to encounter this in your own home. Yeah. Surprise. Um, I, uh, like you said, I arrived home and, and my, my son, my youngest son was upstairs with his friends, got a scream from one of the boys that, that peaches wasn't breathing. When I ran up to ask him what was going on, they said that they'd all been out. And with a dog out in the yard, they come back in. He had taken a shower and he just passed out. And um, I immediately got Narcan. I there was something about the boys. It, it was just it was just so out of character. And I just drug him onto the floor. Realized, hollered at my wife to call nine one one. Put him on the floor. Started doing CPR and uh, uh, used a syringe. Gave him a four milligram dose of Narcan. And continued to do CPR, and finally he, he started to come around, and then the emergency team arrived. Uh, uh, it's it's interesting for me because uh, I'm in the field of addiction, and and one of Cammy's one of the ladies that Cammy was with in Washington at that DA meeting is a good friend of mine, winning the fight, and I've been involved with him for years, so I've been around it. So to see it in my own house even though I'm involved with it and my kids know I'm involved with it was an eye opener and I'm trained. I've been trained on Narcan for years and I'm trained the trainer. So I train other people to teach people how to use it. And, and now I'm having to use it on my own son. And, and of course, as, as you know, my story, Joy, one of the two boys that was there that day, uh, he used two weeks later and, and his parents didn't have Narcan and weren't trained and, and he perished. 
two weeks after my son. So it, it, our town is overwhelmed with it. And then we're just in a regular town, but it's like every other town in this country. And that's so how I defer to Cammy for what she said, what Kathy O'Keefe says, what, what all of them are saying, what we see on the street. It's not possible to get any kind of street drugs today that does not have fentanyl laced in those drugs. Mm -hmm. It's not possible. Mm -hmm. And when you think about for parents, you know, and I don't know who want to take the, take this question, you know, parents, you said this is eye opening. I know in both, you know, two cases of this, you know, Jake and Cammy, it started from a prescription. You know, in a lot of kids, it may start that they're experimenting with prescriptions that they get, whereas theirs were actually prescribed by a doctor. You know, what do you think parents need to be aware of? You know, do they think it can't happen to them? I don't know who wants to take that question. Maybe, Cammie, this would be a good one for you. Do you think parents think this isn't going to happen in, in, in my house or I know what's going on with my family? Um, what would you say to that? Uh I, I, t I get a little defensive when I hear that because I have had parents say that to me. I, I'm sure that the um, parents of the West Point vets that were on spring break did not think ever that their kids would experiment with drugs and they overdosed on spring break. So um, if you don't want to be realistic about that your child might be in a certain situation with peer pressure or whatever reason to take the drug, then get Narcan for maybe your child's friend because it could happen to a neighbor. It could be a neighbor calling you and saying, their son is on the floor, the living room floor, do you have anything to help? It's actually happening in bathrooms at coffee shops all across this country. Mm. we're having to train servers across the country to administer Narcan. So don't be in denial and say, oh, and it's too late. Woulda, coulda, shoulda. And there's also, you know, there's a, there's a group out there that believe that Narcan is enabling drug use. Mm. Well, that's going to make somebody go ahead and be able to do drugs because they have Narcan to revive them. And I, I do get a little defensive on that as well. Um, it's not your place to play God of whether somebody lives or dies or deserves a second chance. Would you not help somebody that was drowning? Would you not give a diabetic an insulin shot if they were in shock? I just, I really don't have time for that kind of discrimination. I just think it's so sad that people think that that's the reason not to carry Narcan when you could actually save a life. And it's not hard. And if you see somebody overdosing, or let's say that you think they're overdosing and you administer Narcan and it wasn't an overdose, it will not hurt them. So there is no reason not to have it or not to use it if you feel that that's what's happening. I, well, I that's a, in, Can I jump ahead, in just, mm -hmm. yeah, because uh, and Kenny made a good point. It's happening in the bathroom of coffee shops. Mm -hmm. Well, I just saw a thing. They're training all the librarians in the libraries in, in Philadelphia because people are using in the library. They're coming in there to use and, and it's happening on your street. It's happening next door to you. It's happening. This number of people, it's happening next to you. It's mm -hmm. right next to you. Supermarkets, every place. What about college campuses? Are we thinking uh, that, that? Absolutely. Absolutely. The kids, the kids use social media. They don't need to, they don't need a dealer anymore. They use social media and they, and they get it amongst themselves and you don't even know they're getting it. There's no, it's not like, oh, like baking bread, breaking bad and all these great movies that show depict addiction. It's experimentation. I think Cam even said it. These kids do pill parties that they get on social media. Those pills aren't pills. They're, there, that's the chemical warfare that Cammy mentioned earlier. That's what people have to be aware of. If you're touching it with your hands, you're touching chemical warfare. That's how bad it is. Mm -hmm. One of the stories um, that the DEA shared, well, actually it was a mom I was sitting next to that I met. Um, and if you can imagine going into a ballroom at a conference and over 250 parents that have all lost their children were all in the room mm -hmm. together. It was the most heart-wrenching experience I've ever been in, but there was an immediate connection that, that we all had with each other. But a mother was sharing with me, her 14-year-old went to a slumber party, 
They were on Snapchat. Somebody reached out to him and said, hey, you can take this. You'll be dancing and laughing. You won't be able to stop laughing. The drug dealers aren't on the street so much anymore. It's all done on the black market. And everyone at that slumber party died. They died. Whoa. 14 years old. Gone. So don't be don't be naive is I guess the message here and and carry Narcan just to just for the sake of hopefully you're never in the situation that Philip was in. But thank God that you had the Narcan, Philip, you know, and I just really want to thank Carla and Jake for coming out and speaking because people I mean, to just know that there are survivors and, and for you all to be willing to share your story and to be vulnerable is so, so, so uh, impressive. So thank you for that. Yes. And I have one more question and I'm throw out to the panel before we go to, cause you guys have all talked about Narcan. We're going to give a, a demo of that. We have a mock simulation to show how to do that. Then we're going to bring on Dr. Mark Calarco, who is a medical expert to kind of weigh in on this and really get the conversation started. But I, I wanted to touch on the stigma part of it that Cami referred to the stigma and the secrecy. Jake and Carla, could you relate to the stigma and the secrecy um, behind this? Do you think that played a role in you getting help sooner? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, the, just the societal stigma of what an addict is, um, you know, not only like, I mean, really in a sense, we, you know, we are discriminated against, um, you know, because there's that, you know, faction of people that just think it's a choice um, and, and without really understanding the, you know, the true nature of what addiction is. Um, but I, I really just feel like there's, um, power to be got in that with addicts, but it, it, it holds us back because in the beginning, it's something that we have to be secretive about. And we, you know, we self-medicate. That's what we're doing in the first place because we already feel bad about ourselves. We already don't like the person that we are. And then we compound that by, you know, knowing that, man, I should not be doing this. I don't want to do this, but I have to do this. Um, and it, it just puts you in that trap and you're just, you know, nowhere to go. And the only thing that makes you feel good is, is to, you know, self-medicate and, and to take that, that, that substance, um, and feel good in the moment, but your problems are still just right there waiting for you. And, um, you know, that, that's, uh, you know, negative thought, um, is something that needs, needs to be, you know, really pounded upon with the community of what an addict is because we come in all shapes, sizes, and forms for sure. So. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And Carla, when you hear Jake talk about that, did you keep it a secret or did you find, I know you said there was something that was the catalyst losing both of your parent, you know, dealing with the loss of a parent, having that pain, feeling like that hole you described inside. Did you feel like you had to keep it a secret? Did you feel like you were struggling with what do I do or how do I, get help? Um, I was in denial. So I, you know, I've had, you know, two, I had uh, a go around with Xanax in 2008 through 2010. And uh, I didn't take, you know, I, that, that was round one. And then I was in denial during that time. Um, then when I started taking it again this time in 2000, I started back on it in 2014, I was able to work with it a little bit. I, I thought that I was okay, but as we know, I wasn't. Um, I just stayed in denial. I just told myself that I need this. I People don't understand me. And uh, um, I didn't really, it was very, even though, I thought to myself that people don't understand or people, you know, whatever the case may be, whatever they wanted to think. I did have a lot of shame about it because if I didn't have shame about it, then I would have been able to discuss it. Um, I think that there is that overall stigma that's placed on. So just the fact that there was that little voice inside that was like, well, if you don't think you have a problem, then why is this all you think about? Or, you know, what are you going to do when you run out in a week, a 30 day prescription, you run out in a week. Um, I think that uh, the stigma is that like Jake mentioned, you're, you, you know, 
people have an immediate image of, of what an addict is. Um, so you tell yourself, you know, again, like Jake said, if you don't, you know, addicts have a problem with self-worth to begin with. So I think that the stigma of, you know, addicts are frowned upon, addicts are this, addicts are that, addicts are, you know, junkies or, or you know, whatever, whatever negative word that is, you know, tossed around, you know, the, and, and that's from lack of knowledge. That's from lack of understanding people that that make references like that. Um, I think that uh, I think shame and guilt and then, you know, com uh, shame and guilt is, you know, it, it feeds into the stigma itself. So, you know, if we're shameful and we feel guilty about what we're doing, then we are going to keep that secretive. Then in turn, that only feeds into, you know, feeds into the stigma of how an addict is perceived to begin with. Yeah. I mean, I think that is just when you think it just almost becomes like a perfect storm. And then if okay. you don't seek help at some point and you're struggling, then at some point you're likely going to overdose. And if you keep going and don't get help, at some point you might overdose and may not make it. So I think that's very important to talk about that because if people don't feel comfortable coming to their families, if we don't create safe spaces where people feel like they can talk about this, where families feel like they can share, then these individuals, people are going to continue to hide and they won't get the help before it's too late. So I think that's important. So first, I want to next go to a video of, we talked a lot about everyone knowing how to reverse an overdose. We're going to go to a video um, demonstrating, a mock demonstration of how to administer Narcan. We're going to come back and add one more panelist with our um, expert, Dr. Mark Colarco. And then if you have any questions in the interim, please drop your questions in the chat for our panelists. We'll get to as many questions as possible um, that we have from the audience. But let's take a look at this Narcan demonstration. First of all, we want to make sure that they're not just asleep. So the first thing you would do is come up and say, hey, are you okay? Hey, are you okay? Are you awake? If they don't respond, then like you want to go ahead and take your knuckles and kind of rub it on their, their, their breastbone or their sternum. Because that's a little bit irritating. It usually wake people up in their deep sleep. If they don't respond, the next thing you want to do is go ahead and see if they're breathing. So get your ear really close to their mouth and see if you can feel or hear any breathing. If they're not breathing, um, the next thing you can do, <clears throat> if you know how to, is to go ahead and just look for a carotid pulse right here. The final thing to do is to look at their eyes, see if they have <clears throat> checked their pupils. If their pupils are very pinpoint, if they have pinpoint pupils, and if they're not breathing, and whether or not they have a pulse, with or without, it gives you very high risk of, of suspicion they might have overdosed. The next thing I would do is make sure the person is on their back before you administer any medication. And then <clears throat> you're going to go ahead and you have Narcan available. We're using this nasal spray because it's very easy for non-trained um, people to use. It's very easy, just like a nasal spray. Just peel the back, leave that, you don't need it, and then pull out the nasal spray. It's just like an allergy nasal spray. On your dominant hand, use your index and middle fingers on the top, and your thumb here is to push the medicine when you're ready. You wanna go ahead and insert it in either one of the nostrils and make sure their head is back a little bit so you can see. You can even touch their nose slightly if you need to. Insert it in here, and then use your thumb and press it all the way in. And then you wanna turn the person on their side, what we call the recovery position. And what you're gonna do is you're gonna go ahead and have them bend, have them bend their knee like their leg like this so they don't lay on their stomach and turn them on their side. The reason why we do this is because if they do wake up and they do and they are recover they are recovering from an over an, an uh, opioid overdose, they can vomit and we don't want them to aspirate. The next thing you do is you monitor them. If they don't respond or they 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 become awake and then become unconscious again. You could administer another dose of Narcan every two to three minutes as needed until help arrives. Some of the very powerful narcotics that are out there, such as fentanyl, are 100 times more potent than heroin. And when you give Narcan, <clears throat> it'll reverse the respiratory depression and it'll start breathing. But the drug's so powerful, it'll, it'll have it re exert its effect and people can go unconscious and stop breathing again. So you need to monitor that. 
And we're back again with our panelists here. Um, Philip has actually had to use Narcan on his own son, um, and he was able to revive him from an overdose. We also now want to bring in our expert, Dr. Mark Calarco. Um, he's who you saw there in that overdose prevention um, training video, um, just to give us some more insight as we kind of delve more into this conversation. So thank you, Dr. Calarco, for joining the conversation with us tonight. Um, I want to start with you and ask you, you know, when it comes to Narcan, um, who needs to know how to use this? Use this? I know Cammie kind of touched on it where she said, hey, we need to all know, you know, what are your thoughts around that? I, I think she was spot on. And in fact, just like we really want people to carry EpiPens for people who have allergies, a, a bee sting, maybe, you know, they eat a food that they have a, a, a anaphylactic reaction to, things of that nature. I'd like to people to think of Narcan just like that. You know, it should be, and everyone, I would say even children can learn to do it. In some cases, a case of, of, a, of a parent overdoses. It's very simple. Basically, I don't. I think it should be universal. Yeah, I definitely think that universal. That people know how to do this. Now, people want to know for someone who's experiencing an overdose, how effective is it, and how quickly does this work? So, first, yeah, that's a good question. But the first thing I'd like to say is that if you're worried about hurting them with the Narcan, the naloxone, you shouldn't. The side effect. And severity of, of any side effects are very, very rare. And of course, if someone is overdosing, it could save their life even, even in that event. But for the most time, it's a very benign medication. And if they aren't having an overdose, for whatever reason you give it, you're not going to really cause them any harm. So I want people to not be scared that they're going to hurt somebody with that. Right, exactly. So, so, so naloxone has been around a long time. Same thing. It's been around a long time. It's very, very effective. We use it in emergency rooms. Uh, and it's, it's really great that now it's out, uh, common use. You can get it without a prescription from a pharmacist in many states. And it is highly effective. That being said, as I mentioned in the video, and in many of the panelists mentioned things about fentanyl, we also have things that are even more, that are as or more potent than fentanyl out there now. They're all synthetic opioids, right? And they can make people have respiratory depression and, and overdose very, very quickly. And so... Typically, the, the nasal spray is a four milligram naloxone, Narcan, and that's pretty good. But with the increasing breaking bad of all the types of drugs that are a lot more potent these days, oftentimes you're going to need more than that. Now, if you're in an urban area or a suburban area that has, you know, very quick access to EMS services, one dose will probably be sufficient, like in uh, Philip's case. But if you're in a rural area or out somewhere where you may have, uh, I always recommend, I, I always carry two just in case someone has fentanyl, carfentanyl, etonidazine, you don't, there's all these, all these uh, chemical uh, now that are all will cause respiratory depression. And you, you could probably, you might need more. So. Now, I know one of the concerns that people have, and then I'm going to start opening up some of the questions to all of us on the panel, is the fentanyl exposure. People are concerned if I help someone and they've taken, you know, they've been exposed to fentanyl. Is there a risk? Do I need to be concerned? And I know that's a touchy question, Dr. Calarco, but um, I know it's one that's on the minds of people that they might right. be thinking about. I mean, if you, I, I would tell people not to be worried about having any significant exposure for, if you're going to help save them with Nar Narcan or do uh, BLS, you know, CPR, things of that nature. I think the risk is extremely low. You can't say it's non-existent, but extremely low. The highest risk, if you go into, you know, uh, a place where they're, they're producing it, right? And you have fumes and vapors and there's, there's more residual in the environment. But I would say, by and large, um, your risk is exceedingly low if you're, a, if you're a good Samaritan. Okay. That's good to know. And I think that's where, very important. And where can people get Narcan, you know, in their communities? Um, most people might understand you know they hear this they see the demonstration that we kind of walk through um you know but they're wondering where can i get this is it available do i need a prescription in most places right, right. you know how easily accessible is this well as a physician i don't want to be a gatekeeper to knock a narcan i think people should be able to get it without a prescription like we do many other formally prescribed medications given that the state of the epidemic that we're having it's extremely safe right so I don't see much downside. Uh, so it varies state to state. 
Some states do have laws on the books where you can get it without a prescription. You just go and request it from a pharmacy. Some, some places require a prescription or even if they have laws that have been changed that allow supposedly easy access, sometimes there's misinformation or lack of knowledge on the, on the part of healthcare professionals and they may not get it. There may be some barriers, I, I guess I should say, to getting it when they're legally really aren't. Um, so again, that's all about educating everyone uh, mm -hmm. But but you, every pharmacy carries it. Mm -hmm. And Cammy, I see you had something you wanted to add there as well. Oh, Cammy, and Phyllis, yeah. I see you're both chomping at the bit. You have some insight here yeah. from your perspective. No, I just wanted to mention because I just recently found out about this website because it can be it varies again state to state, just as the doctor just mentioned, um, and it sometimes can be like eighty dollars. People can't afford it. If you go to next n e x t distro d-i-s-t-r-o dot org and you have to watch the video of how to administer narcan and then you fill out a form and they they mail it to you for free nice. um hmm. and which is can you amazing. repeat that again let's see if we can get that up on the screen that's great um, um let's write that down we'll pull we'll pull that up in a banner at the bottom you said it's next yeah it's next n-e-x-t D I S T R O dot org. Okay, we got it up there on the screen. So next distro.org, you take a, a, a video where they know that you know what you're doing, and then they'll actually mail it to you. Thank you, Cami, for that, because I think that's very instrumental. And Philip, I could see that you had something that you wanted to add on to what Dr. Clarko was saying there. And I, I echo the doctor's uh, statement and, and what uh, Cami said. Uh, most states, the majority of states today, consider Narcan to be something you sh that you get very readily available. Any pharmacy range 35 to 55 if you're buying it. Almost every state today, there's training available. If you'll Google Narcan training, uh, almost everybody that trains in Narcan today, a lot of the nonprofits today, they will dispense, give you the Narcan at the completion of the training. We just had training this weekend. Three of the Love Cassidy did it. They're going to do it again here in Dallas. Uh, winning the fight does it. We're in a kind of a, a tough s right now for supply side uh, for whatever reason, but but it's available and it's available. It's easy to get. If you're really interested, just leave a message in the chat and one of us will get back to you. We'll make sure you get Narcan. I mean, that's that's the easiest way to do it. Yeah, and I think that website that Kat, um, Cammie mentioned, I want to put that back up there just in case. Yeah. Um, I think that website is very important. If you want to be able to get access to that, it's down at the bottom of your screen that you can do that. So now we're going to start to take some questions from the audience because I see some questions are coming in. Um, but before we do that, um, you know, when we think about who's at risk, um, who is at risk um, when we're thinking about the overdose crisis? And doctor, you can take that or whoever wants to take that. Who do you feel is at risk and needs to be thinking about this? I'm happy to answer, but everyone here is an expert and could answer the questions. And we'd like to. No, go ahead, Dr. Clark. Oh, who's at risk? I think. Okay. Feel free to jump in, anyone. All right. I'll... So, you know, addiction affects, you know, every, every walk of life in every country and that for that matter. Uh, every gender, right? Every nationality and orientation doesn't really matter, right? It's just, it's a human thing, right? That occurs. Um, and let me think about this. Joy, give me a little bit of heads up more, uh, just kind of give me a little more, uh, repeat that question just for, for a moment. Yeah, like, so I'm thinking more from an overdose. Like who's most at risk for having right, an overdose? Right. Sorry about that. So I, I want to, you know, because I know a lot of times we think, is it the first time you use? We talked about, I know Cami shared the story of these 14-year-olds. Right. And sometimes I think it happens, you know, it can be instantaneous where we see this with these counterfeit pills. You never know how much fentanyl is in them. But are there certain risk factors that make people more likely to overdose or things that they need to be um, thinking about. Okay. Yeah. So, go ahead. Did, I was going to jump in there. Sure, Sorry, Jake. doctor. Uh, no, please, Jake, go for it. Yeah, definitely. You know, in my experience, some of just, for example, like people that um, 
you know, go to jail and maybe in county jail for a long enough period of time to where they've, you know, went through that detox process. Right. And um, then they get out and they go to take the same amount of what, you know, what substance that, that they're used to using and their body's not used to that anymore. Right. That that's so somebody who stopped using basically essentially right. saying if you stopped using for a period of time, maybe you've been in recovery, you go back thinking right. you can use the same dose as you used before. Right. That is the typical time that we see people overdose more often um, than not because the body has it is no longer used to that same dosage and it doesn't have the tolerance build up. Is there any other ones that we can think of that are risk factors? You know, I'd like to uh, oh, go ahead, Doc. Oh, I'm sorry, sir. You know, just, to, just to kind of dovetail off what Jake said, you know, it, people who go in, we're going to, I'm going to go into treatment for opioid use disorder, right? And they go through detox, you're an inpatient, and then they get out, they're supposed to have a discharge plan, right? That helps them have some continuity, right? But if they are discharged and they are on some kind of MAT or something, medication or assisted opioids, therapy, I want to make that sure the, people know the, the chance of overdose is extremely high. For, because the receptors got naive, but also, um, you know, they're, they're, you haven't really solved the problem with just a short, a short course of treatment, right? And so this is why I think a medication-assisted treatment or MAT is extremely important for, for all kinds of substance use disorder. But I think for risk mitigation, I think for opioid use disorder, it's the most important. Mm -hmm. let, me, let, me, let me jump in because I want to jump in. I'm sorry, but we're, we're, we're looking at this like it's and we're using the word addiction. That's not what, that's not what we're talking about this, because if it weren't for fentanyl, we wouldn't be having this conversation. We mm -hmm. just we've all come accustomed to. We have people that struggle with addiction, and we just figured out a way to ignore them. The only reason we're having this conversation today is because it's the people that haven't even ever developed an addiction that use the first time that just happen to be walking down the street yeah. with a friend, going to experiment. They're going to take that drug like that party that Cammie mentioned. They're dying. And that's and those are the people that that's what we're it's not just the people we say, oh, these are these people. Are, we got to stop using the word addicts. These are people with a substance use disorder. And we we're not going to ever get these people to get help if we keep if we get it. We got to get away and get the person facing language. We got to stop it. We had the same crisis with the AIDS crisis. I don't want to get into it, but we had this crisis and we started labeling people and suddenly we, we weren't helping them. And then all of a sudden we figured out, we got to stop the labels. Right. It's anybody in this country around the world. I'll go to Dr. Calarco's statement. So it's, there's no genetics. There's no, if you use substances today that are not prescribed by a physician, you have an 88% chance of dying. One in four people that use a substance from the street is going to die from it. Mm. The numbers are horrible. These are horrible numbers. And we, and again, if it weren't for fentanyl or Zydate, what's what's the other drug, Doctor Calarco, that new yeah. one coming out? Yeah, it's, it's the nitazines. One of the most the potent is etonitazine. Yeah, right. It has no medical. It has no medical use at all. It's a hundred times more potent than fentanyl. Correct. As soon as people find that drug, the numbers are going to escalate. So we got to stop thinking. Well, it's about people that are addicted to substances. Right. It's about everybody. Mm. And that's why we're having the conversation, not because people have substance use disorder, because we've had that going on forever. Mm. Cammy, I know you had something you wanted to, sorry, to share Cammie. as well. No, no I'm sorry, I mean, you're passionate about it. I think that, I mean, I love hearing your perspective as someone boots on the ground there, uh, um, you know, in the Texas area. So Cammy, I know you had something that you wanted to add to that as well. Well, just, um, you know, a grandmother could take more. She could have missed her. She thought she took the medication. She didn't think she took it, but she really took it. And she takes another dosage. Grandmother could need Narcan. A toddler gets into their mom's prescription because the mom's got 50,000 other things going on. Right. And the toddler takes the pills. Many, there could be a, a slew of different scenarios of why you would need Narcan. And that's why you should just have it. Right, right. And, you know, I, I could just, you know, what I'm so impressed by is just the passion here. You know, Philip, I can just tell how dear this is to your heart and everybody here. So we want to start taking some questions from the audience. I know we've had a couple that have come in. So we're going to put those on the screen and then we'll get to a few of those questions. Um, 
just to make sure that we are answering what people want to know. People are wondering where all of all of these drugs are coming from. Dr. Calarco, I think you could provide some good incentive, not incentive, but some good insight on where are all these drugs coming from. You talked about the fentanyl, you talked about the nitrazines that are now out there that we're worried about. Where's all this coming from? So the problem with synthetic opioids is that you don't need a poppy, an opium poppy, mm-hmm. or you don't need coca leaves, okay? for It's not, an, you can make them, you can cook them up in any of your private lab in your house, things of this nature. That being said, the vast majority do come through from China via Mexico. And, uh, you know, we have some internally, obviously, as well. But that's probably the vast majority. It's very easy to smuggle in because of it's, you know, in a powder form, so concentrated. doesn't, you know, small amount goes a long way, in other words. Mm-hmm. And I know, Philip, we had talked about this on another discussion. Yeah. That you guys have eight ports in Texas where they were we seeing eight- this. Yeah, eight ports of entry in Texas. We brought just in Texas alone last year. There was enough fentanyl that we that they captured to fatally overdose 33 million people. In the U.S. alone, 588 pounds was captured en- en- enough to fatally overdose. I hate to use that term overdose because that means it sounds like there's a proper dosage. But right. to fatally kill uh, to 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 kill 133 million people. That's what was captured. The DEA will tell you today that's a fraction of what's coming into this country. So, mm. so you you are going to see it next door. It's next door to you right now. Because it's just coming in. I mean, that eight ports, I mean, that puts it into perspective, Philip, when you talk about they had enough to, you know, kill 133 million people. That is, mm-hmm. you know, the number. So that's why people have to be aware of this. So I think there's a lot of warnings here tonight that one, all of us, sh- should have Narcan because there's so many different scenarios. It's the first time person who takes a counterfeit pill. It's the grandmother that can be mentioned who may have, you know, taken too much or forgot to take her medication. It's the person who maybe went to treatment and doesn't have the support system coming out and ends up taking the old dose of the drug. So there's so many different scenarios here. I think that's very important. So I think that we 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 really hit home that everybody needs this. Now, another question coming in from Bill, can you discuss the storage temperatures or limits for naloxone? I think that's important because people are gonna go out, they're gonna tap into that website that we got or maybe go to their pharmacy and get this. And Dr. Clark, you probably be the best, best one to give us an insight. How long can you keep this um, naloxone, Narcan on you? Um, how long does it last? Can you use it if it expires? Can you answer those questions for us? Uh, yeah, that's a very good question. From Thank you. So, you know, there there is an expiration date on those. Um, many people, many, many healthcare professionals, we use things beyond the expiration dates, but we can't really condone that for, for people. So if it has an expiration date and expires, you probably should get a new batch, okay? Uh, feel, but, feel okay. but also the expiration you know, the, the actual potency of the medication will, will vary greatly. Like you, during the summer, we've had a really hot summer throughout the world in many places. You don't want to keep that naloxone in your car because, you know, uh, sunlight, solar radiation and temperature will decrease the potency. Doesn't mean it becomes completely useless, but it, it has usually a room temperature indication and you want to keep it in a cool, dry place away from sunlight. And okay. then I should, as a professional, I should say, once it expires, get some new one. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And as a non-professional, I carry it with me and I'll use it on anybody that's that's ill. And I and I carry, and I carry it needs not be in your car. The doctor's right. It needs to be on your body. It needs to be with you. It needs to be with you in your office. It needs to be with you in your house. It needs to be in your gym. It needs to be so with you. Do I hear you, Philip, saying, and maybe does everyone agree that businesses need to have this on hand? That maybe grocery stores, different places that we need to make this um, a regular thing. Like now, many places you go into, they have AED machines. Is that something else that you guys think that we need? Absolutely. Yep. Uh, Amy, you were going to say something? No, I mean, you know, you have fibrillators and things like that. It's the same thing. There should be the same thing. Like at airports, every time I go through the airport, I ask the TSA, what would you do if I overdosed right now? Do you have Narcan? Right. I don't know what you're talking about, you know, um, which is scary, right? Um, Because a lot of people take a Xanax or something when they're flying with anxiety. And, you know, so I, I, they should be at airports, they should be everywhere, but why not just like they have 
defibrillators and things like that for heart attacks, it could be the same type of situation. Mm -hmm. um, and why we're not taking a more extreme action as a country is is unexplainable, honestly. I mean, and, and if you go back to the states that require a prescription, it is my understanding, and Dr. Costco, you could, you know, back me up if this is true or not, but my understanding here is that doctors have to take a certain test to be able to prescribe it, mm. which is ridiculous. Doctors mm. don't have to take a test to prescribe Oxycontin. So why would they have to take a special <laughs> exam to prescribe Narcan? I mean, I just really think this has to come from the private sector because if we wait for the, the government is not taking enough action, in my opinion, we're, we're watching our kids die everywhere. The war is going on in our backyard. And so if we really want to save lives, we have to scream out as a society that this needs to stop. Mm -hmm. So when you say we need to scream out as a society to get this to stop, what do we need to do? What do you guys think are some of the solutions? I know, of course, us having discussions like this are important. Um, do you guys have any thoughts on what you think needs to happen? Do we need to start talking to kids at younger ages? You know, I remember when I was growing up, we had the just say no to drugs in the schools. Um I don't know that we still have that as much. You know, the whole, I just remember that you had, here's your brain, here's your brain. I mean, you had a lot of education. Um, what do you guys think are the solutions that we need to be talking about if this needs to come from the private sector? I don't want to hog the conversation. Sorry. I'm just like, ah. <laughs> I actually, Joy, I was online yesterday with, uh, uh, for the, for the Narcan uh, when Laguna was on there yet uh, for the Laguna one yesterday. And uh, I can't help but stop thinking about, I keep thinking about what Rebecca said about how so many drugs now are laced with uh, that. There's fentanyl laced in, in everything that you can, uh, uh, someone can, can think that they are, uh, they want to get, you know, high, not low. And they, they, uh, take meth and it can be laced with fentanyl. And, I mean, and when they think about meth being laced with fentanyl, they were right. saying it's in cocaine now. So I think, you know, so you and, think there's this, this education component, like we need to let people know what's really going on. What are the risk factors that the risk that there is an inherent risk just even one time. Right. And, and, you know, I was th I continue to think about it for an extended period of time yesterday and, you know, of course, rolling into today. And I thought, you know what? Education is important. Yes, that that's very true. And we need to continue to educate people. But we also I think that we need to also look at it from an addict's perspective. An addict when when as an addict, it, when I if if I make the decision tomorrow that I'm going to go out and I'm going to get high, there is not anybody or anything on earth that is going to stop me from doing that. I'm going to do that because I've made my choice. Now, with that, I think that if we look at it from that, we can't stop everybody. We can't. And that's so unfortunate. And it's so sad. But also, too, think about how we looked at it in the 90s with with the with the AIDS epidemic. They took the approach during that time period that, hey, we know that people are still they're going to watch this commercial or they're going to see this and they're still going to go out and they're still going to have unprotected sex. OK, however, though, they did continue to let them know this will happen if you do this. So I feel like we need to talk more about the consequences of what, you know, if you go out, if you decide that you're going to, that there is no regulation on a straight drug at all. And I mean, it doesn't really sound like it, it doesn't really feel safe on prescription pills either to tell you the truth. But um, I think that things like the, if you are going to go do meth, you know, you need to understand that statistically that when you do that, you're, you may not get the high that you want. You may not get the same high that you got yesterday. You may die. So mm -hmm. I think that that we need to sound the alarm. So what I hear you saying, Carla, is that we need to sound the alarm like these are the this is the risk now. You know, like you right. said, um, like Philip said, we may not even be dealing with this right now if it wasn't for you know, fentanyl as much. We may not right. have it at these levels, but we need to be sounding that alarm and saying, hey, here's the realities. And do you think enough news, are we talking about it enough in the news? 
are we or do you see enough stories? I mean, we did we do see headlines, but do you feel like the conversation is getting buried with other things? Like we've become immune to it because it's becoming so, so commonplace. Go ahead, Cami. I know you wanted to say something. Um, there's actually going to be a walk uh, protest on the White House stairs on September 17 of mothers that have lost their children to fentanyl coming in from all over the country. So the best thing that the DEA did when they brought us to Washington was putting us all together that we got to meet in a room. And so now we've built an army and we need everyone, every US citizen to get behind us because we are trying to save other children. Our children are gone. Our children are gone. We can't bring them back, but we can fight to save your children to save your brother, your sister, your aunt, your uncle. This is the reality. And when I say we're under a chemical warfare, look at the age group that they're killing. Right. Kids that are going into the military, that's the age group, okay? Mm -hmm. So we really need to be taking this seriously. Um, it's because of people like you, Joy, that have this, this platform for us to be able to speak openly on Facebook and to be able to educate people of what's going on. Um, but it, it's tragic. It, it really is tragic. And we do have to start educating at a young age. And if you look at what we just experienced with COVID, we, we were able to get everybody back and vaccinated. Why can't we distribute Narcan? Why can't, why can't we take a hold of this and take control of this? Um, it, do, it doesn't make sense. And so that's why the protest is happening at the White House on September 17th. Now, if somebody wanted to get involved with that, Cammie, how could they do that? Because I know you threw that out there. Um, can they go to your website and find more information or what would you recommend if there's somebody who's watching this that says, I want to support what you're doing? Because I know you already have the Christopher Wolf Crusade. Could they just reach out to you on your website and maybe go yes. from there to get connected if they, they wanted to support some of the efforts and things that you're behind? Yeah, there's another mama. We call ourselves Mama Angels. Um, there's another mother that lost her child out of Chicago that she's actually spearheading this. But I can get the information. Um, if you want to reach out on my website, I can get the information to people. But I know that it's going to be just, I know they're doing a walk, a march um, in D.C. on the steps um, on September 17th. Okay. Uh, go ahead, Philip. Yeah. You were going to say something? Yeah. I want to go back to something that Carla said because that really moved me a lot to hear what she had to say about, uh, again, I want to go back and go back to fentanyl. I want to get focused on fentanyl because I, I have a feeling we get lost, you know, because there's a lot of people that have, they have this moral sort of attitude about what they're dealing with. And if they don't understand this, they won't, under, they're not going to understand it. And they're going to take it like somebody said earlier about, well, if you have Narcan, you're just promoting the use. You know, we are seeing people today, I'm seeing people today that are actually fentanyl users. Mm. And they say they they declare themselves as the drug of abuse for me is fentanyl. Mm -hmm. And going back to what Dr. Calarco said, this is manufactured. There are no standards. Uh, there are standards for the manufacturing process in, in a manufacturing plant. But this is this is starting to pop up. Pretty soon, you'll see mom and pops, people making this. And and it's already so dangerous because you don't know what you're getting. To go what Carla said, you have a drug. You think you're getting um, a drug, maybe something as simple as a Xanax. This is where it's happening. You're not getting a Xanax. You're getting fentanyl. But if you're expecting a Xanax and you're something, a mood stabilizer, and you put this in your mouth, you're going to sleep permanently. And and I and, and that's why the we've got to continue to focus on the word fentanyl right now. We're not seeing people. You know, it's we're just not talking about heroin anymore. We're talking about fentanyl. Right. I well, mean, I just think there's so much. I mean, I think that there's so much that we've talked about tonight. I want to make sure if there's any other questions from the chat, drop them in. I want to while we wait for any. Final questions. I know this has been such an insightful conversation, but what I want to give everyone an opportunity to do um, as well. Let, we got one more question before we go that in Indonesia, they have the same in Indonesia, they have the same problem or how they resolve how they resolve the problem if it is resolved. Um, I think does anybody I guess I'm trying to understand what he's asking with that question. I guess in other countries, there's dealing with this as well. So he's saying, hey, this isn't just uh, is it yeah. just a USA problem that it's 
all over the country. I mean, all over the world, actually. We, we consume as a country income. more opioids and more drugs than any other country in the in the world. Yeah. I believe. Yeah. I think we surpass everybody. We, I'm we sure disposable around yeah. the world in other countries for sure. Um, but I mean, you know, there's a lot of controversial things they do in Europe when they have places where they hand out free needles and things like that. But they've also shown a reduction in overdose as well. So, but the, you know, there's just there's arguments for both sides on on it's very controversial to hand out needles. But I mean, look at the drug. The I mean, it's been successful in San Francisco that they've done it in San Francisco, right? So. So it harm is reduction. Harm reduction yes. is another thing that we've right. talked about. Of course, we know we do want to get people into treatment. Definitely have to say that because if you can get people into treatment, you know, we do know this is a chronic disease and then people need to learn how to how to be able to manage it, you know, like they would a diabetes or something. So I think there's so much that we've talked about here tonight. So and we went over a little bit on our time, but you guys just were so passionate and had so much to say. You know, and I can only imagine the impact. I mean, from the people who are going to watch this tonight live, but I guarantee you all that people are going to watch this on the replay, that more and more people are going to hear this because what you had to say. So what I want to do is I want to give everyone a chance to say some final thoughts. If there was any final message, any final words that you'd want to say um, tonight, I'm going to start. I'll start with Jake. Um, any final thoughts that you would say, final message that you want to get across and then we'll go to Philip, um, Dr. Calarco, Carla, and then Cami. I want to end with you. So, Jake, um, we'll start there. Sure, absolutely. You know, just whatever situation or circumstance, you know, really applies to, to you, whether, you know, you are a person struggling with, uh, you know, substance use disorder or, um, you know, just may have a family member that's struggling. Um, you know, there's resources to uh, help prevent overdoses. You know, you can find things at your fingertips online these days. And, and, and you know, there is a lot of support out there. So, um, you know, please don't hesitate to reach out. Keep an eye on your loved ones. And uh, yeah, thank you guys for joining us this evening. Mm -hmm. Okay, Philip. I, I think Jake summed it up. If you, if you, if you're struggling, ask for help, ask anybody, but ask for help. Don't, uh, I just don't want another like Cammy, it's it's heartbreaking to be here with Cammy uh, and all the other mothers just like her, and and then to hear from Jake and to Carla. Before you're one of us on this square, ask somebody for help. Mm -hmm. Very powerful, Carla. Final words from you. Yeah. That was an incredibly powerful statement, and uh, I just think that it's it's critical for. For someone who is struggling to to know that they aren't alone, to know that there is a telephone number that they can call. There is a loved one. There is, a, I mean, you know, a stranger. If someone messaged me tonight after watching this, I would do whatever I could to help them. I would direct them in the right way. I would, you know, do whatever I could. But um, I just think that it's just so important to know that you aren't alone and and show compassion to that person. Even if you don't understand what they're going going through, you are somebody that they came to. You try to understand them. Try to try to to understand, try to be knowledgeable, try to do whatever you can, because it's so hard to say the words, I need help, or it's so mm. hard to say the words, I'm an addict. It's so hard. I tell everybody that calls that, that I talk to on the phone, how proud I am of them, no matter if it is the first time they've called or the 10th time they've called, because that's such a difficult phone call to make. It's so difficult to verbalize, to, to say that I need help. So I think that the more awareness we have in every capacity, everything that all of us ha have discussed this evening, and I think that awareness and support is going to, it, it's going to help. It, it is. And uh, that is, uh, that is my final thought for tonight. No, that was so powerful. You are not alone. That is so, so, so huge. So yeah. huge. So um, Carla, I think, Thank you for sharing that. Dr. Calarco, um, I know from the medical perspective, you've had so much and I know you've treated people with addiction. Um, you've seen this from many different angles. So what would be your words, your final words? 
Well, I'm really encouraged by listening to all these wonderful people here today and, and all those who are listening. I, I think that's the power of, of the, you know, the sort of the community um, of a like mindset. But I, I, I'd like to imagine a world or let's say a country, let's imagine the United States where everyone, everyone carries Narcan. I agree. And and with the hope that they never need to use it. But if everyone had it, think how many hundreds of thousands of lives you could save. Wow. That is a powerful thought. Powerful thought. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt. I, I just wanted to interject that we we can't stop the distribution of it, right. but we can do what we can to stop the effect of it. We, we can do what we can. And that's incredible that we have the ability to do that. Yes, I like that. We can't maybe stop the distribution or we can crunch down on that, but we can stop the effect of it. And that's powerful. So Cammie, you know, I want to to end tonight with you. I know you have a book coming out, um, The Flight, where you're sharing your story, your journey. You have your foundation, um, Christopher Wolf Crusade. You are on the front lines warning other parents about this. So I really want, you know, just your final thoughts tonight in honor, you know, in memory of your son. Thank you so much. It was a privilege to be with all of you. And since you covered, uh, I want to I want to also remember the families because, you know, families it's it's a family disease. And do not give up on your loved one ever. Do not. They are in there and they need their family. But families, you need support as well. And there are many organizations. I'll mention one, Partnership to End Addiction. They have so many resources online to help mothers, fathers, siblings, you know, loved ones, um, because you got to have also the support and the help to take care of yourself so that you can take care of your loved one or someone that's fighting addiction. Um, I guess, you know, we have to just come at this as compassionate as we can. Let's all try to just connect. It's about connecting as a people to help each other mm -hmm. um, and love one love one another. That's that's the key to me um, is just because that's what's got me through is love. And so mm -hmm. that's what we need to do for the people that are struggling. And I really want to thank you again. So, Joel, you did a tremendous job with this show. Thank you. No, and I want to thank you, Cami, and all of our panelists here tonight. And if you are someone who's struggling, you can reach out to any of us. You know, there's also a phone number down there. Um, Cami gave us a great resource to get Narcan. Um, let's put that back up one more time, that if you're trying to get Narcan in your community or you're wondering where you can go, um, you can find it there. We put that website down there. So we hope tonight that if nothing else you got from this conversation, it's that we all have the power to save a life. We all have the power to end the stigma and we all have the power to be compassionate and loving and to make a difference, to have an impact on this overdose crisis. Thank you all for joining us and good night. Bless you.